Hello and welcome back to All You Can Board. I'm Carlo and in today's video I'm going to be talking about 15 amazing card games. Each of them uh, pure card games pretty much. The whole point of this is to look at games that uh, not only use cards as their main sort of feature but I'm trying to eliminate it from contention if possible. Uh, any games that use you know cardboard or have extra tokens of sort. Um, there's obviously going to be some little exceptions made for certain games. Uh, I've consulted the official AYCB judges to determine which games would be uh, you know eligible for this type of list and which ones aren't. Um, I'll just get it out of the way right now and say my number two game of all time, Race for the Galaxy, is not eligible for this list because even though it's mostly cards, um, there's no way to get around playing with those, the victory point uh, chips. You really do need those. Similarly, another game that would have made this list otherwise is something like uh, called For Sale, uh, auction game with a bunch of cards, but you have your money as all in these little tokens. So there's a couple exceptions I've made that the judges are allowing based on the fact that, uh, you know, some of these components, even though they're not exactly a card, you could just ignored and play the game like it, it's sort of just a placeholder for where your cards go on the table or that sort of thing so a couple of these do have non-card components but the main reason I've decided to do this video is um, we've, we've been talking whether it's on our channel or just even off camera in our discord we've had a lot of these discussions lately about the board game geek rankings the top 100 and how they tend to favor these heavier you know games in terms of the weight uh, expensive games games with a lot of miniatures nice table presence that kind of thing and there's just so many good small box games out there that do so much with just cards and you know I'll say right now out of these 15 games none of these are in the board game geek top 100 and it's an absolute shame that so many of these first off a bunch of these should be in the top 100 some of these should be even in the top three 400 and they're not there's some of these are so criminally underrated and I just feel like it's you know again with with so much focus on these big you know crowdfunding campaigns these big expensive games I, I really want to take the time to highlight some of these games that you know most of these cost between 10 and 20 bucks are super easy to learn uh, and you know could be just as valuable to someone's collection or you know could provide just as good of an experience as a lot of these bigger kind of heftier games that are in the top 100 so um, that's pretty much it uh, I'm not going to rank these in any way the way we're going to look at them is just going from oldest game all the way to newest uh, some of these I have physical copies with me here other ones I do not so I'm going to just jump right in with the oldest game on my list which is one I do not own a copy of myself this is Six Nymphed. So this was designed. This was released in 1994, uh, designed by Wolfgang Kramer. It's number 610 on the BGG rankings. And what I love most about this game, so it's basically a game where you have a hand of cards with a bunch of different numbers. The deck has cards numbered from one to a hundred and something. And basically you um, are, start with a, a certain positive number. I don't remember what your score starts at, like 55 or something like that. And you have these cards that have different numbers and these bull symbols on them. And simultaneously every player is gonna pick a card, put it face down, then all all players are going to reveal them and there's going to be these rows of cards on the table with numbers and all the cards that get revealed from each player are going to go sort of in sequential ascending order into these rows and when a row fills up if your card takes the last spot in the row you're going to end up taking all the cards in the row and taking cards is bad you lose points and it's basically you know whenever someone gets into negative below zero it'll trigger the end game whoever has the most points wins i love the aspect again the fact this game came out 94 this is almost 30 years old already, um, and you have the idea of not actually wanting to get the cards. So you're, there's a hand management game because you start with all these numbers and you have to decide which one of these am I gonna save for later for something else? Which one am I gonna play now? How am I gonna get the best out of this? And it's the reveal moment. I've only ever played this actually on Board Game Arena, but the reveal of when the cards go up and you see them sliding into the slots where they go into the sequential order and everyone's going, oh, Oh, wait a sec. Oh, wait. Oh, no. Oh, and then someone has to take a bunch of cards and get a bunch of negative points. Awesome. Creates a bunch of laughter around the table. And it surprises me that this game came out in 94. And uh, it's sort of gotten a bit of a resurgence lately, it seems, maybe thanks to Board Game Arena, but still a game that I don't think gets uh, talked about enough. So that is Six Nymphed. Then uh, the following year, we got High Society. This is one that I own and I've only played once so far, but I love it. Uh, this is an auction game designed by Reiner Knizia. This is number 551 as of now on the Board Game Geek rankings. Uh, auction game where every player starts with a hand of cards um, that represents their, their money. And you're basically flipping from a separate deck of cards, a card that goes up for auction uh, that has a value on it. And then players are using their cards to go around the table and bid. Sometimes it's a good card. Sometimes it might be a bad card that you're bidding to not have to get stuck with. Basically, once the end game uh, triggers, the first thing you do is you check to see how much money everyone has left. The person with the least amount of money is automatically eliminated because the idea is that they spent the most money throughout the bidding, and then the winner is determined from the players who are left over. Uh, what I love about this game that it does amazingly well with cards is the fact that you have, again, this limited hand. I think you have 12 cards at the start. 
and they range from you know one to twenty five or one thousand to twenty five thousand or whatever. And there's big gaps, you know, from the the next highest after 25 is I think 20, and then there's like 15 and 12 and all these gaps. And when you play a card, whether you win or lost the bid, I mean, there's certain ways you can get your cards back, but once you've spent a card, you don't get it back and you don't get change. So your cards are this hand management kind of resource of like, you know, even the number one card, which technically only increases your bid by one, it's only worth one, but once you play that, you can't outbid someone by one on a future turn. So the value of these cards changes, and let's say you end you, near the end of the game, you're left with your 25 and your 18 and all these big cards, and you just want to outbid someone by three. Well, if your lowest card left is 12, if you want to outbid, you're going to have to spend that 12. So it's a really interesting kind of decision throughout the game of when do I spend this card and what's it going to get me? How much is it going to be worth later versus what will allow me to outbid people with? So very cool stuff. One, I cannot wait to play more. Uh, that is High Society. Then we skip ahead a couple of years to 1997, and that is to Bonanza, which I do own, but I don't have a copy here with me. So that's Bonanza with Uwe Rosenberg. This is number 482 on the Board Game Geek uh, list, which again is so low. Um, and this is a game about trading beans. Um, and this one, technically, yes, there is something other than cards. It's just the bean fields, but you could play without the bean field. They're sort of just a placeholder. Um, but you're basically playing, you know, you have a hand of cards that represent different beans. And one of the things I love most about this game is the fact that you cannot rearrange the order of the cards in your hand. And that's where all the negotiation comes from. Because on your turn, you start by, you have to play the card at the front of your hand. And then you can also play the second card in your hand. But you have limited fields where you can plant only one type of bean in that field. Uh, so, you know, sometimes you're forced, you feel like you're going to have to play a card, which if you don't have that bean type on your field and you don't have any empty beans, you're going to have to get rid of an, uh, a field of beans and do a harvest preemptively before you were to, you know, get to this point threshold. You're going to have to harvest early to make room for something. So you're trying to trade your cards based on where they are in your hand, which cards you do or don't want. You're trying to trade with people, but when people sense that you're desperate, they think, oh, they just want to get rid of that in their hand because they don't want to be forced to play this card. So it's a really interesting thing where, and, and even the points, when you score them, you just flip the cards over and those have a coin on the back that show your points. So just a really smart design that it has this awesome little negotiation system keeps track of the points you know the whole thing with the order you play your land it's, it's all just with cards amazing game very underrated especially as far as Uwe Rosenberg game goes uh, games go people always look at his big box games but uh, I think Bonanza is you know just as worthy of being on the top 100 as as a lot of his other big box games now we're going to jump ahead to 1999 and we're going to look at Lost Cities. So this is a Reiner Knizia uh, two-player only card game and this is number 328 on the Board Game Geek rankings as of now. Uh, you're probably familiar with the game so I won't get too into it but you're basically, uh, there's five colors of cards and you're playing cards to try and pursue these expeditions. And the more cards, uh, they're going to be cards ranging from value uh, two through I believe it's ten, as well as these three kind of wage uh, wager cards for each color. And you're trying to play these cards to kind of wager how far you can go into this expedition. If you, you know, every column sort of once you play a card you automatically start at negative twenty and then the cards that you have there are trying to bump you from the negative category into the positives. You're basically starting your turn by playing a card and then drawing one off the board so you can pick up your opponent's discards and that kind of thing. Um, and that's one of the things I love most that it does with the cards is first off, I like that most of these Reiner Knizia games, he has you playing a card first and drawing at the end of your turn. So you're not starting your turn by gaining a card and having to reassess your options by gaining new information. You might already know as soon as your turn starts, I play a card and then I draw and then I can think about my next turn when it's my opponent's turn. And the fact that when you're playing cards, you can either play them, uh, out, you, you know, you're discarding to this common pile where your opponent is going to be picking up cards. So you have to hold on to them long enough that by the time you discard it your opponent doesn't want it anymore or you're trying to hold out hope as to you know maybe I can not play this color or show that I'm going to be going into green cards because maybe my opponent will discard a green that I pick up before I start playing green cards awesome game plays over three rounds you add up your scores across all three rounds really good things we've talked about this on the channel before so I'll just leave it at that but that is Lost Cities then we're skipping ahead just one year, same designer, and Battle Line, which in my opinion is an even better two-player only card game, uh, also by Reiner Knizia, which I left at home, unfortunately. Um, and this is another one that technically I'm cheating a little bit, but the judges confirmed that, you know, those little wooden components that represent the flags, yes, technically they're in the box, but you could just, you know, to determine who won a flag, you could just maybe turn one of the cards on the winning side or something to, to replicate that. But uh, what I love about this game is you're basically playing nine simultaneous poker hands, uh, three card poker hands, where you're trying to create, you know, runs or flushes or uh, straight flushes and whatnot. 
um, in each of these rows to win these battles and you're trying to win either three battles in an order or any five battles uh, across the board. What I love about this is that there's one card of every, like every card in the, in the game is unique. There's one card of uh, each number and, and across a few different colors. But the idea is you're sometimes winning battles by proving that the opponent cannot beat you anymore. So let's say I had a three of a kind sixes on my board already. And let's say my opponent had two sevens on their side. I know that they're holding out for that other seven and if they get it, they can beat me. But if I can prove based on the other cards on the board that that other seven is not, that there's no sevens left in the deck, for example, then I will win that flag. So I might be holding, there might be one seven left, but it might be in my hand and I can't show that card. But if I were to play it somewhere else and then I can say to my opponent, hey, look, I, you know, there's two sevens there. There's only four more in the deck and you can see they're all out on the board. Therefore, it's impossible for you to draw the seven. Therefore, I win this flag because my three of a kind sixes can't be beat. So there's this aspect of, holding cards and playing certain cards, even though they might not help you on the board, other than just proving that somewhere else you've won a battle. Love it, it's genius. I haven't really seen that in any other games that I can think of, and it's part of the reason why Battle Line is one of my absolute favorite games of all time. It's in my top 10 of all time. Um, yeah, and it's number 250 on the Board Game Geek rankings. Again, super underrated. It should be way higher than that, I think. All right, next we're gonna talk about Coloretto. This is a very small box card game. This was released in 2003, designed by Michael Schacht. This is currently number 585 on the Board Game Geek rankings. Uh, you can try this on Board Game Arena, which is where I first tried it. I highly recommend because you, if otherwise, if you did like I did for years, and I looked at this and just thought, oh, this weird colored chameleon, small box card game, I kind of dismissed it. Um, I didn't think there was going to be much to it, but you're basically drawing a card from a deck and putting it into one of uh, the rows on the board, and every round, each player is going to end up with one of those rows of cards. The, card, the rows are going to have a maximum of three cards, um, and basically you're going to be either choosing to take a row when it might have one card that you really need and no other cards, so you might only get one card that round, or you might take a row that has three cards and maybe two of them you really need and one of them you don't need, and it's going to hurt you because at the end of the game, you're looking at all the different colors of cards that you've gathered and you're only scoring points for the three colors that you have the most cards in. So you're going to score positive points and then you're going to look at all your remaining cards that you might have, you know, one or two of in certain colors and those are going to subtract from your score. So it's a really interesting dynamic of trying to decide where to put cards in which row to, you know, offset the temptation that someone might have. You know, you might see a row where you know someone's going to take that card, but well, then I'll put this card that I know that's going to lose them some points to offset that. And on your turn, you have to decide, do I want to just take what's out there or do I want to flip another card and add it to the row and then wait and hold out and see if I'll even be able to get that row. That, that row might be taken by the time it comes around to me. So really interesting game and it has a sort of unknown uh, end game thing because you, you know, there's, you put the end game card near the bottom of the deck and so you can't completely card count and know when the game is going to end because that card's going to come out as a surprise to tell you when the game ends. Anyway, Colorado is awesome. Uh, plays up to five players. Excellent little filler game. Okay, uh, next we're going to skip ahead five years here to Dominion. This is uh, a 2008 game that actually won the Spiel des Jahres. Uh, designed by Donald X. Vaccarino. This is the highest ranked one of any game I'm talking about on the list here. It's number 108 on the Board Game Geek rankings. And Dominion, you know, a lot of people will say these days that Dominion is kind of, um, uh, it's been improved on or it's kind of outdated now or whatnot, but I, I've played it fairly recently. I think it's still an amazing game and sure it's not maybe my favorite deck builder anymore, but every time I play it, I still love it. And there's a couple things I think it does really well with the use of cards and it is the biggest box. If any of the games going to be talking about, it, it's definitely the biggest box, but it's because of how many different cards there are uh, and there's 10 of each card. So you're basically setting up this market uh, every game of 10 card options and each of those options is going to have a stack of, I think it's either eight or 10 uh, and you're basically building a deck but you the, one of the interesting things I love that this game does is that the points are directly built into the cards so you buy cards that are just points and nothing else so at the end of the game when you're counting up your points and this doesn't count any expansions of course it's just the base game you're looking through all your cards and seeing the point values on them but those cards when you actually draw them throughout the game they're not doing anything you're not scoring points when you draw them they only, those points are only happening at the end of the game so they're dead weight they're just slowing you know cluttering your deck but the longer you wait to buy those victory point cards, if someone else starts buying them sooner, you might not have as much time before the game ends to buy those. So it's an interesting decision of how early do I want to start buying those victory point cards? How many of them do I buy? You know, what's the state of my deck? How many cards do I have in there? Can I afford to be starting to fill this with victory point cards? Or do I wait a little longer, build up my engine a little more, and then start the race for the victory points? So 
interesting little timing considerations that I think it does really well. And even just the mixing and matching of all the cards in the market to, you know, you could remove one of the cards and put in a different one and that might completely change the complexity or the, the uh, kind of um, state of the game because you might find a different combo on board just from that one other card that's available with those other nine from the same game before. So I could talk about Dominion a lot more, but I'll leave it at that. It's an excellent game. Uh, next, we're going to move on to Innovation. So Innovation is a game from 2010, designed by Carl Chudik, and this is ranked number 346 on the BGG rankings. This is one of the most impressive um, games I've just played in general, and one that I've been uh, sort of warming up to more and more over time. I've been playing it a lot, kind of a running game, uh, going with uh, my friend Braden on uh, Board Game Arena lately. As soon as we're done, we just rematch. We keep playing over and over and over. Um, it's an amazing kind of like Civilization-themed card game where you're playing cards that allow you to do all kinds of stuff. There's these uh, effects that trigger that basically you have to have these different symbols on your cards that represent different types of like technologies or advancements. And basically uh, there's ability, there's dogmas that happen where you either have to have the same amount of symbols or, or more as your opponent. Um, there's also these demand dogmas that you can demand, that you can say, uh, you have to do this based on the fact that I have the majority on these symbols. The coolest thing though to me is the card splaying um, and that has to play off the symbols. The splaying is basically fanning, imagine fanning the cards out either to the left, the right, or up to reveal more symbols so that you now have the majority on someone. So if I want to use this card, I might have fewer symbols so I can't use the ability or my opponent's going to you know, use the ability first before I get to do it. And so the splaying of the cards, you're stacking cards on top of each other that, you know, you might have eight purple cards on top of each other that aren't splayed, and you're, you know, you might be taking cards from the bottom to put in a score pile, you can tuck more cards under, splay different directions, there's just all, there's cards that you get that just say, if this condition is met, you win the game. So there's all kinds of different win conditions, it's just, it's a game that continues to blow my mind every time I play it, and the fact that it's just, you know, Carl Chudik is kind of known as like the master of the multi-use cards, um, but I, I haven't seen a game do quite what innovation does with just that, that deck of cards, and it feels like a, a nearly infinitely replayable game. Amazing game, it's on board game arena, highly recommend you try it out if you haven't yet. Okay, next we're going to jump ahead five years to my favorite game probably of any of the ones that I'm talking about today, the highest ranked one on the list, or maybe I guess it was number, no it's probably number two, I can't remember which if I had this higher or battle line, but this is Arboretum, incredible game, plays two to four players, um, designed by Dan Kassar, this is uh, ranked 289 currently, I've done a video on the channel before where I talk about why I think this is best at four players, which goes against the kind of popular opinion on Board Game Geek, where people seem to think uh, that it's best with two. Um, so you can go check out that video if you want to know more of my thoughts on player count. But um, I'm just going to focus on what I love about this game that it does with the cards specifically. So you basically are building a tableau of cards and um, you're putting these trees of different cards in different colors in front of you and laying them out in a certain formation to try and maximize your points. But at the end of the game, you're only going to gain the right to score the points for the cards in front of you if you have the highest total value of cards remaining in your hand for that type of tree species. So let's say, you know, the orange maple trees. You know, three or four of us could all have these cards in front of us, but at the end of the game, we're going to look at what's left in our hand. You're going to have, I believe it's eight cards left in your hand, or maybe seven, um, and you're going to reveal the cards of that color, and whoever has the highest value is the only player that gets to score. So really interesting hand management aspect here where you're trying to decide the value of your cards in terms of am I going to get more to this from playing it or am I going to have to hold on to it to make sure that I can actually earn the right to score for the cards that I have on the board. So the higher value cards you have not only can they score you more points but the higher value also helps you win the right to potentially score those points so uh, not only which cards to keep for yourself to try and make sure you can score those points, but if you see someone else, an opponent who has a tableau that might score them, you know, 12 points in one color, then you might be holding on to a card to try and deny them the points at the end. So this game, every single turn is agonizing, incredible game. I could play this probably hundreds of times and never get tired of it. Um, does so much with so little, just numbers and colors with a loose theme about these trees. Um, yeah, always surprised me what this game does with just a deck of cards, that is Arboretum. Okay, next up is a game that is only one year older, or sorry, newer than that, from 2016, that is Hero Realms. So this is on the Board Game Geek rankings, is currently number 221. So this is a deck building game, kind of like Dominion in certain ways, um, just in the sense that it feels like a fairly pure deck builder, but you're not buying cards that are just, you know, straight up victory points. 
What this does that I think is really cool is that it's a deck building game where, again, it's just cards, but everything comes from one shared deck. So both players are, you know, there's going to be cards that come out from this market, uh, and you're basically, each player starts with a certain amount of life. I think it's 50 health. You're trying to attack each other and do a certain amount of damage until the other player reaches zero health and loses the game. So there's four different like type, uh, colors of cards, and you can get creatures or champions, they're called, that stay out in front of you that can kind of block so that you can't actually attack uh, your opponent and whatnot. But you're going to be buying cards of colors, and what I like that this game does is there's cards that'll have... Uh, the symbol or the, the color of the card also in the bottom showing that if you get another card of that color, let's say I have this you know blue card. If I play another blue card, there might be a basic ability that always triggers, but there might be another thing that has a blue symbol at the bottom that shows if you have at least one other blue card in play, now the secondary ability will trigger. So you're trying to build your deck of either maybe probably just one or two colors. You don't want to go across all four colors because you're going to have all these cards that don't, you know, you don't get the full effect out of if you're not triggering that bonus effect. And of course, each of the colors has its own kind of theme. You know, the white or the yellow cards have more of like a healing or protection kind of theme. Uh, you know, the red ones allow you to like trash cards from your deck to thin it out to be more efficient, that kind of thing. So you're trying to decide early on from the five cards that are available in the market, which color are you going to go into? And if your opponent starts buying cards of the same color, do you stubbornly keep doing that? Or do you buy cards from a different color and try to build your deck in a different way? So it's an interesting thing because unlike a game like Dominion, which you talked about, you're just racing to buy victory points. Whereas this one, you're actually fighting your opponent. And a lot of these games where you're normally attacking your opponent, games like, you know, Magic the Gathering and stuff is like deck construction. It's not something where you're buying cards from a common deck, putting them in, and then immediately going head to head and fighting your opponent. So um, it's not one of my favorite ones on the list or anything like that. It's a game I've cooled on a little bit over the years, but still an excellent game. Um, and yeah, if you're familiar with Star Realms, this is just the newer version that has a fantasy theme instead of sci-fi. All right, after Hero Realms, we moved up to 2018, and we're going to look at a game called Sprawlopolis. So this is definitely the smallest in terms of just, you know, again, it's a little wallet. There's 18 cards in here with a tiny little rule book, and that is it. This is ranked number 397 as of now on the Board Game Geek rankings. Um, and yeah, this came out in 2018. So this is a game where you basically have these double-sided cards. Um, I have, there's a video on our channel as well where I compare Sprawlopolis to Agropolis, the newer one, so you can go check that out as well for a more detailed look at it. But um, basically, one side of the cards has your scoring conditions, and the other side of your cards has your actual city uh, like layout terrain kind of cards. And the idea is you're going to shuffle up this 18 card deck, pick three cards at random that are going to show you your scoring conditions for the game that are going to determine how you're going to get most of your points or potentially lose points. Um, and then the 15 cards that are left get shuffled up and they stay on their city uh, side, basically. And this game plays solo all the way up to four players. I think it works best solo. And you're laying out your cards and connecting roads and trying to put different you know, districts either together or build your city in a different way based on the, the you know, uh, point conditions that you have for that particular game. So there's so many different combinations. Even just switching out one point card for a different one can completely change the way you're going to go for your game if you have objectives that are competing against each other rather than incentivizing you to, uh, you know, do one thing that helps meet two or three conditions. There's just always a different puzzle to solve. Uh, fascinating game that does so much with so little. Again, like you can fit this in your pocket. You can fit multiple copies in your pocket. There's expansions that come in little sleeves as well. That you can just fit in your pocket, take them anywhere you go. Um, this is pretty much the ideal travel game. The ideal, you know, you got 15, 20 minutes to kill on your lunch break kind of game. Amazing little game that is Sprawlopolis. And that is published by Button Shy Games, which I will say, for those who don't know, they do a ton of these uh, kind of wallet-sized games. So definitely check them out if you're interested in something with such a low footprint and such a low cost. Next up, we're going to talk about Point Salad. So this is a 2019 release uh, designed and published by the folks of Flatout Games. Sorry, it's published by AEG and Flatout, but designed by the folks from Flatout Games. This is a two to six player card game. Uh, it was currently ranked number 390 on the Board Game Geek rankings. So in some ways, you know, there, there are certain things it does that you've seen a lot in other games. Set collection, scoring conditions, you know, you're getting cards that tell you, you know, at the end of the game, you score one point for every tomato, or you score three points for every, you know, pair of tomato and carrot that you have. Or, you know, if you have the most onions of any player, you score this many points. So there's all kinds of different scoring conditions, but the cards are double-sided. One side is the scoring condition, and the other side has a veggie. And the interesting thing is, on the scoring side, in the corners of the scoring card, it also shows what veggie. It has a little symbol, like a tomato, to show that what's on the other side of the card is a tomato. And you're drafting cards from the central uh, area, 
there's gonna be six cards up for grab, there's three columns, but anytime you take these veggie cards, at the top of the rows above the veggie cards, the cards are on their point side. So you can either take two veggie cards face up, any two veggie cards, or you can take one point uh, condition card. Anytime you take veggies though, to refill the empty spaces, you flip point cards off the top of the deck onto the veggie side and fill that space. So the board is gonna be refilled and you're trying to decide, you know, maybe I know that my opponent really needs that scoring card, but instead of just taking the scoring card to deny them, if I take the veggie that's in that row, I know that scoring card's gonna flip over and now they won't be able to get it. There's a way that on your turn you can flip one of your scoring cards over to the veggie side. So if you're not meeting a condition, you can kind of you know, switch it over to a veggie instead. But once it's a veggie, you can no longer flip it over to the scoring side. So I just love that aspect of, you know, what you're drafting, you have to consider how the cards are gonna flip over. Are you gonna draft a veggie that's gonna make one of the point cards that you wanted disappear and turn into a veggie? Are you gonna take a lot of point cards first and then try to find the veggies that meet those conditions? Or are you instead gonna get a bunch of veggies and then find the point cards that'll get the most out of the veggies you have? Super simple game, but it surprises me every time I play it point salad. All right, so we had some bigger gaps between the, the years of release of these games uh, earlier in the list. Now we've got some that are kind of closer together. We obviously just looked at point salad from 2019. Now we've got two games from 2020. The first one is going to be Stellar. So this is one we have talked about in the channel before. It's a two-player only game uh, designed by Matt Riddle and Ben Pinchback. Uh, this was uh, 2,172 currently on the Board Game Geek rankings, which is Absolutely ridiculous. I'm gonna go ahead and imagine that this is just because not enough people have played it because it is a really, really good game. Um, basically, in this game, you're only gonna get 11 turns. You're gonna be building out this tableau of cards uh, that is a sort of a, your, your telescope. Um, and then you have also your notebook, which determines how you score the cards in your telescope kind of thing. So I'm not gonna get all into the rules, but I'm gonna mention what I really like that this game does. Well, there's a couple things I really like this game does with cards. First off, as I mentioned, you're only getting 11 turns, but every turn you're gonna be placing two cards, uh, one in your notebook and one in your telescope. You're gonna start by playing one card and then whatever the number is on that card, there's gonna be a menu of options from I think one to five that you can choose from. And whichever card you play first, you choose whether it goes into your notebook or your telescope, and whatever number is on there, let's say it's number three, then I have to take the card that's in the number three slot, and then that one has to go either into the, my telescope or notebook, whichever one the first card didn't go into. So you're starting your turn by choosing which card do I wanna play, both in terms of where where is it gonna go in terms of the points it's gonna get me, but also it's gonna determine what other card I get to pick up from the market to then put that card somewhere else. So it, everything has these kind of ramifications, everything is tied to something else it feels like. And even when you're just filling out your the spots in your telescope, there's different uh, like sections of your telescope that you have to have the majority of compared to the other player in order to score points off of them. Um, even the way that you're scoring points based on what you have in your notebook and how that corresponds to what you have in your telescope. Uh, there's just a lot to consider with, again, similar to a lot of the cards on this list, like if you just strip the theme right from it and everything, it's basically just numbers and colors or numbers and symbols. And that's what I appreciate so much about these card games is that it's basically the equivalent of pen and paper with numbers and symbols and letters. Like most of these games just have that and it's just fancied up with some card stock and some artwork and whatever. But yeah, Stellar is an excellent game. One that I think got really overlooked by a lot of people. Um, it's a bit of a table hog, takes up a lot of space and it might be a little bit of, you know, rules complexity to wrap your head around for the first time. But uh, once you get a play of this under your belt, I can see, you know, most people I've heard who have talked about this game really do enjoy it quite a bit. So yeah, that is Stellar. The other game from 2020 that I want to talk about, very different type of game, is Abandon All Artichokes. So this is designed by Emma Larkins. I believe this is her first um, published design. This one is currently ranked 1,720 on the Board Game Geek uh, rankings. This is on Board Game Arena in case you want to try it out. It's a game for two to four players. It says it plays in about 20 minutes. I think that sounds about right. The idea is it's a deck destruction game. So it's got deck building as well, but you start with a deck of these 10 artichoke cards, and the idea is you're trying to as the title goes, abandon all your artichokes. So the way the game is gonna end is, you know, on your turn, you're gonna be picking something up from a market of cards. You're basically adding a card to your hand. You're gonna be playing cards from your hand. And then at the end of your turn, you're gonna draw cards from your deck back up to five cards. As soon as someone draws five cards at the end of their turn and none of those five cards are an artichoke, they win the game. So that's something I haven't seen in any other games. I am not, I don't know if it's entirely unique. It could be in other games, but the fact that you your primary goal is tra is getting rid of the artichokes. Most deck building games, you're looking at, oh, what do I wanna buy? What do I wanna add? 
you're and you know trashing is something that you can consider you can think about getting rid of cards and i guess technically in abandon all artichokes you could just fill up your deck and hope that you get you know such a bloated deck that you might still have eight nine ten artichokes in there and maybe you get lucky and draw those five but realistically if you want a shot at winning you're gonna have to thin out your deck but also know which cards to add at what times you know, which players to target because you might think that player has probably two artichokes left in their deck. That player over there might have four or five. So if I'm going to do something, I might want to go for the player who's closer to winning or whatnot. Uh, very cool game. It's not something that is going to be like one of my favorite games of all time or anything like that. And I think it works much better with the more players you add. Best as a four player game. But uh, yeah, the fact that it's that deck destruction and the whole drawing cards to see if you win at the end of your turn is just something I haven't really seen in other games and something I think this game does very well. Um, plus, it's just a very kind of like uh, accessible, approachable game for families, for kids, whatever. So, um, but something that adults can still enjoy quite a bit as well. So yeah, that's Abandon All Artichokes. And the final game I want to talk about today, the newest one on the list, of course, from 2021, Enchanted Plumes. So I will mention this is a review copy that just got sent to us, uh, designed by Brendan Hansen. This is currently ranked 6,247. I mean, I imagine not a lot of people have even played it yet. I believe this is something that initially got uh, funded on, on Kickstarter and was recently fulfilled. Basically, this is this shares a lot of similarities to two games I already spoke about on here, which is Lost Cities and Arboretum, because you are it's basically a hand management game, and there's different colors and numbers of for each color. Basically, they're unique cards, though. I think there's ten different colors. It depends on the player count, but you're basically playing these cards down in formations that go into a. Uh, you're playing rows of cards that then decrease one card fewer in each row until you try to get down to one card. So you might get a top row of four cards, then three, then two, then one, and that might be your, your plume for your uh, peacock. And the way it works is, at the end of the game when you count points, for every separate um, plume you've started, the cards on the top row are negative points, and you're only going to offset that by the positive points that come below it. But you don't know when the game is going to end and you might not, you know, get as many positive cards in that plume as you wanted. Or you might want to, you might have a bunch of cards of a certain color and you can only play cards on a row if there was a color or a card of that color played on the row above it. So you have to decide which colors do I want to play and what numbers at the top row, what kind of negative hit do I want to start with and what colors do I want to leave myself available that now I can... You know, I have the rest of the game to try and get as many cards of that color and of the highest value in this plume as I can before it finishes. And if you manage to get that final card at the bottom and you've completed your plume, then you're going to score bonus points, one point per card in that plume. So you can play the whole game trying one giant epic plume. You can keep starting multiple different ones. You can have four, five, six by the end of the game. There's a lot of freedom to do what you want. Um, and you're switching cards out from your hand for ones in the market. So you're putting stuff out there that other players might want, or you're taking cards cards that other players have put out that now you want. You can draw blindly from the top of the deck. A lot of cool stuff. Um, and it basically feels like, again, it has taken some of the things of games like Lost Cities and Arboretum uh, in terms of the hand management and higher scoring, but it's also taken something, it took the aspect of Colorado that I mentioned with the uh, unknown endgame thing, where, you know, one of the things that I think maybe might be a slight fault of Lost Cities and Arboretum is the fact that when it gets down to the end, you can kind of card count and a bit and know, okay, if I do this, I'll trigger the end of the game. Oh, the, I know I'm going to get one more turn and then the game ends on that person's turn. It's not the case with Enchanted Plumes because you have this uh, game end card that's somewhere in the last seven, so you never know, is it going to come back around to me? And you don't know, is someone going to draw from that deck? Is they going to swap out cards from the middle? You might get two or three more turns than you think. The game might end before you think it's going to, and it's just about kind of that push your luck and deciding where you want to put your cards. Do you want to try and maximize one plume or divide your attention equally? Um, this is something we'll be tr probably talking about on the channel more as we've gotten to play it more, but excellent little game that really surprised me. That is Enchanted Plumes. And that is it. That is 15 of the most standout cards only or pure card games that I could think of. Um, I'm sure there's others out there that I either haven't played before that I might have overlooked. I'm curious to hear what you think of these and what are some other ones that I might have missed. If there's a game you know of that's either 100% cards or could be played with just the cards and the other components might not be all that important, uh, let me know in the comments below. Let me know what you think of some of these. Um, which ones are your absolute favorites? And also, what do you think? Do these card games deserve to be higher on the list? Do you agree with me that, you know, Part of the reason I did this is I know a lot of people are, you know, strapped for cash and you're wanting to buy games and a lot of the time those games on the wish list are these, you know, 80, $100 games or you're tempted by something on Kickstarter and just know that there's almost always going to be a, you know, if not better, at least a an equal um, option that's just like 
a more affordable game, takes up less room, and even just the variety, I tried to cover a variety of different, you know, mechanisms and interaction styles in these games, you know, there's negotiation, there's a lot of trash talking, there's games that have hand management and, uh, you know, set collection, all kinds of stuff here. Um, but yeah, I'm curious if I, you know, missed any gaps in what a card game can do that maybe none of these fill. So yeah, let me know in, in the comments below. Uh, better yet, if you want to talk with some other gamers about this, hop on over to our Discord server. There's a link in the description below. Otherwise, that's it for today. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Bye.